I start with an image that I hope is familiar to you from our um, exhibition and from the wonderful catalogue which we all continually use um, in the last five years. It's the 18th century, late 18th century watercolour of Waltham Cross, um, which famously was first conserved by our uh, fellow antiquary William Stukeley in the 1720s um, when he urged the society to pay for the placing of a wooden bollard to protect the cross from um, passing traffic. It was only one of um, uh, a handful still then surviving, and of course in the 17th century we had lost the other crosses at Cheapside and at Charing Cross eventually to be replaced by later replacements. Um, what's more, Stukely went back to the site uh, a decade or so later and found that the bollard had been removed and it was at that point he got um, uh, someone local to build the brick plinth under the cross uh, or around the base of the cross and replace the bollard. The cross is still with us today, now with steps up to it, um, but with the added change that the statues that you see, which survived in the 18th century, are now in the local museum. I start with this because it seems to me to be a very good example of the sorts of questions as to why we look after things, and where else would I want to start, but with the society's rich tradition um, of doing that for our great monuments and the material culture of our past, but also the, the, the sorts of things that, that come up in the considerations of these, that this cross was increasingly a rare commodity. They had met, many of them had disappeared in the um, 500, 600 years since um, Eleanor of Castile's death and the progression of her body to London. Um, there had been, the century before, at the time of civil war, a significant loss of two of them. So it's something about the, in, the increasing uniqueness or the particular uniqueness of this cross, which was very important. The fact that if you seek to preserve something, you have to go back and check how it's being used and what's happening to it. The preservation order may have um, succumbed to other local changes. Um, and then also the very physical fabric itself may have had to be further dismembered to protect parts of it and taken indoors. It seems to me these are all still relevant when we turn to the protection of 1960s buildings, about which I'm going to talk uh, today. Um, two weeks ago, uh, two garage canopies were listed by English Heritage. The great um, canopy here at Markham Moor, at West Drayton, Nottinghamshire, and then the canopies uh, over the garage at Redhill on the A6 uh, in Leicestershire. This is by the American architect Elliot Noyes. Um, Markham Moor is 1960 to, to 1, this is being 1964. What's very interesting about these is the rationale for English Heritage's um, uh, wish to preserve them is very much about uh, thinking of them in terms of what they represent about 1960s culture. Um, a great celebration here of the age of the car, uh, greater car ownership than ever before, the um, moving around of people to different places by car, and the way in which these petrol stations are felt to reflect that new mobility and movability um, in the period. Notice they're not exactly in their original content. The great Markham Moore canopy now has a restaurant tucked in underneath it. So here's an, a, a way in which a, a 1960s iconic roof has been put to new York, to, to, to new use. And also, um, I think one of the things I want to question about this is the sense of in listing these buildings, um, this is still a garage, so you're still having the drive in and drive out again um, expectation of the 1960s. But on the other hand, it's very interesting that we're now being encouraged to travel less by car and that 
when you set up something like this as a monument, um, supposing this ceased to be a garage or the road layout changed or something, um, this was a monument which was meant to be seen from the driver's window and um, was meant to signal garage in the 1960s. What's to become of it um, if its uh, function changes? So that business of going back and of revisiting things is terribly important if we are to um, understand and uh, make these buildings not only say things about, uh, about their time, but also about the changing circumstances in which we view them, understand them, appreciate them. Um, the University of Sussex is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and my heart sank a little bit two and a half years ago, of course, when the Vice-Chancellor said to me, and of course, Morris, you'll do an exhibition, won't you? Because my experience of helping colleagues, particularly at the V&A, from whom colleagues are, I've learned an, an enormous amount over many years, is that you can't do these things, you know, in five minutes with a team of voluntary students. It takes degrees of professionalism and of careful processes that you must absolutely follow. So um, it did take a long time, and a few weeks ago, my full time, um, putting the exhibition up. It's on until the 14th of June. If any of you are coming down to Brighton, do come and see it. We're open Mondays to Saturdays. You can see on the poster, 10.30 to 5.30. Um, and um, I think it, it is a very fitting way of uh, celebrating this particular occasion. I built up the exhibition and designed the exhibition around the uh, relatively small amount of original material we have. We have a dozen or so original drawings, watercolours, pastels by Spence and his workshop. We have four models from the early 1960s, three of which I put in the exhibition. Um, and of course, we have a great dossier of old photographs taken from the 1960s onwards. We've also used um, a part of the exhibitions you'll see in a moment to talk a little bit about furniture and furnishings and um, a locked case with some university treasures in it. Um, much of the Spence archive, of course, is in Edinburgh, his hometown. Spence, of course, born in India, but his family was Scots, so the archives with Royal Commission Scotland, um, where there's more Sussex material. And there was an exhibition on Basil Spence um, five years ago that went to Edinburgh, in Edinburgh, and went to Coventry uh, quite properly, um, given the cathedral there designed by him. So it was really going to be about Spence at Sussex. That's what I based it on. But in doing some research for this and getting um, other people involved in this, of course, one finds out a lot um, about the university's history. And hopefully, we have built on the record we have, um, oral and um, in written form, of people's memories. Um, of those early years. Um, here's the contour model made in the early 1960s showing the earliest idea for the university buildings in the downscape and on the shallow valley floor of the downscape um, where our historic buildings now rest. It was in 1993 that our buildings were first group of 1960s buildings ever listed by English Heritage. Um, and uh, that listing, of course, one of the things I was saying earlier about revisiting over time, has given the university 20 years to think about that responsibility. And some of the judgment one might make is how far that responsibility has been followed. It's no small thing in a university which has expanded dramatically in recent years to look after historic buildings. One building is grade one, um, the others are, the other six are two star, in a changing environment and given all the pressures on university space um, and buildings. Um, it was, of course, the first uh, university founded in 1959 of the famous Shakespeare Seven, which, for those who don't know, of course, those. 1960s universities are named the Shakespeare Seven because they evoke the names um, of the earls and counts and dukes in, um, in Shakespeare's history plays, Lancaster, York, Essex, Kent, Sussex, etc. Um, they were founded at a time, and it, it is extraordinary to think back to those 50 years, um, 
after the red bricks of the 19th century had expanded slowly, but there was a new vision of what university uh, education should be about, but expanding, of course, compared to what happened post-1992, um, in a very, very small way. You're seeking to admit maybe 15 or 20,000 more students to the university system. Tiny numbers um, compared to what has happened in the last two decades. But the idealism was such that you were going to found these um, new universities with new ideas about ways of learning. You would break the boundaries. You would, in one famous phrase, redraw the map of learning. And several highly idealistic books, including by um, uh, David Deitches at the University of Sussex, the idea of a university, were built, um, were, were written around these, uh, around these ideas. Um, one of the ideas of the university, of the new universities, was to, uh, in some cases, preserve the structures of the past, to building colleges with open spaces uh, for um, uh, pedestrian access and for students to um, uh, make their own ways and spaces around the campus. They were all built, of course, about four miles outside historic town. So there's the idealism for you, which has been a tremendous challenge to them all in recent times because issues about transport, about students who now want shopping and vans delivering their pizzas um, uh, ha have transformed. It is not a society where they'll all be willingly fed by the university and slept comfortably or whatever. They have very, very different expectations. Um, but the idealism was these were out of town places where people would sit in green fields and discuss Plato to NATO as was the title of a course um, in one of these universities. Well, how is this all looked after? Here's a view I took just two or three days ago across campus, and I will return to a, a similar view to this. We're looking um, uh, west towards the library with the sun on it in the morning, and to the left of that, the uh, arts centre, um, 1960s building, and immediately to the left of that, Palmer House, our grade one listed building, which I will say a bit more about um, in a moment. Um, Sussex was a campus built with some iconic buildings, the library, a meeting house, which was to gather in the various religious faiths, or religious faiths or none, of the student community, um, an arts centre, arts buildings with lecture theatres, absolutely state-of-the-art science buildings. Um, but it was also to give a sense of intimacy, of scale in some parts. So in the arts buildings, there's this brick cloister, which shows the way in which the um, university was planned to have those intimate spaces and walkways along which people could walk um, and uh, contemplate and do their work. Um, so challenges about preserving, as we have had to do at Sussex, iconic buildings, which are on the front covers of books, um, and are, are, are famous buildings of their own right, and this sense of the intimacies of space um, which the uh, uh, listing called for. Farmer House in particular, our grade one listed building, has gone into all the textbooks of, um, uh, the, um, of the 1960s period. Um, it may shortly, I won't say too much, be on the front cover of a very, very distinguished series indeed. Um, uh, and it's become the kind of leitmotif of what we um, value. And as somebody once said to me, uh, Morris, it's really like one of your Tudor gatehouses. It's the kind of thing that signals, wow, you know, this is of its period, this is of its time. Um, and the height of the Tudor gatehouse is replicated here by the closed and open spaces that Spence um, uses. Um, there it was in 1963, just after it was finished, and here it is today, still looking much the same with the, um, the paths have been changed, but the green sward obviously is still there in front. Um, ugly signs, I think, saying Salma House, which is quite unnecessary, but perhaps necessary to guide people around buildings. Um, what we don't see, of course, and I'll come back to this bit at the end in terms of summarising the changing landscape, is if you turned around from that view now, you would see the gigantic Brightman Hove um, football stadium. 
um, not in the immediate area of the university, but just across the road. Um, and in a sense, we're rather threatened with strip development, public buildings, and yet more housing between us and Brighton itself. And the road itself, when I first went there in the 1970s, students used to dangerously run across the A27. There were the bushes along the middle. Now it's a fast track onto the bypass uh, around Brighton, and um, you just well, you can't. I mean, there are great um, fences, um, metal fences through the middle. So the landscape around has changed, but just to show you that there has been a care and conservation, that building in some ways is largely um, as it was. Um, uh, but I will come back to some of the uses and uh, ways in which it has changed over time. The um, courtyard of Salma House is particularly interesting, though, and raises the issue of these new and different uses that, to which university buildings are put. The idea of this grand building was it would provide a great dining hall for students, um, there would be some office space, there would be a staff flat where the warden of the university would live, and a former colleague of mine who still lives in Brighton was the first warden here. It will be music practice spaces, it will be a place with a common room for students to gather. Now it's largely taken over, apart from two suites of offices um, of the university administration, by the students' union. So, unlike other universities, Sussex has never built a purpose-built student union, which is what the students deserve. It would be nice one day, in the changing use of the university, to put this um, university building back to some of its early uses of dining, uh, of concerts. There are wonderful letters in the archive in Edinburgh of people who came down to the university in 1962 and went to grand dinners here and described Basil Spence, thanking him for this architecture of how we left at 11 o'clock candlelight um, on the water. Um, uh, on the inner moats of the, of the building and how magical it all was. You have to work quite hard now, given the wear and tear on this building, to imagine what that must have been like. But it's not irretrievable. Now, why, in terms of listing this building, and particularly relevant to the um, another case that I'm going to talk about briefly at the end, where currently there is a rather less um, happy story, why were these buildings listed, and what is it about them that summarises the things that are about place and time that are echoed in those sentiments around these recent listings of the garages? Well, first of all, of course, we have the glamour of Basil Spence himself. He was appointed when he was president of the RIBA in 1959. Um, the great work at Coventry Cathedral was beginning to come to an end. Some of you may know tomorrow. Coventry Cathedral is having its big ceremony to celebrate the 50th anniversary of its consecration. Um, and this great photograph, which we borrowed from Anthony Blee, Spence's son in law, um, hangs in the exhibition, um, is also very relevant because it's about time and about conservation. He's shown here standing outside his office in Canterbury, he had two working offices in London, because he was at the head of a campaign to save those lands which was uh, the, one of only two sets of original gas lamps, a whole series of gas lamps, converted to electricity, but originally for gas, that survived um, in London at that time. So he's a modern architect, but also doing something um, to preserve the past. Um, Spence's reputation, of course, had been built uh, in many ways, um, not least his great work on exhibitions, and there we are at the Festival of Britain, the famous image of the Skylon, the Dome of Discovery on the, on the right, and Spence's Sea and Ships Pavilion, which ran along the seafront um, to the uh, right of Hungerford Bridge, with the Festival Hall is to the left, um, where he set up these great gantries, um, enclosing ships, uh, uh, half and more life-size um, ships, um, to talk about maritime history. So exhibition design, which he'd done really since the 1930s in his first um, involvement in Glasgow, and also um, Coventry itself, um, which shares um, certain things with the University of Sussex. It shares the uh, use of rising ground and the building um, on rising ground. It shares a concern for local materials. Here, of course, the local red sandstone at the University of Sussex, locally made brick, flint, and the modernism comes, of course, in the, in the precast concrete um, of the arches. But uh, at 
care for local materials. And those of you who know Coventry will also know that uh, in the last part of the design, Spence designed three almost freestanding circular chapels and places of congregation. These circular motifs, buildings built in the round, um, are very much a feature of the University of Sussex. So in many ways, a logical progression of these ideas from the um, religious building um, to the secular uh, university at this period. And here we go. Um, the great steps, Spence being sympathetic to the rise of the ground up into the downs, um, the great steps up to the Chichester Lecture Theatre, um, not as grand as originally intended. The UC, UGC, the University Grants Committee, stepped in and stopped him building two great circular science lecture theatres at the top of these steps. And um, my battles on the university campus are things like getting them to remove fire assembly points from that fixed sheer brick wall um, when it could stand just as easy on the building to the side where it now is. Um, of course, the steps are somewhat ameliorated inevitably all over the, the campus with these very, very grand staircases by modern health and safety requirements of having rails at some point um, to help people get up them. So that's in the first phase of the 1960s, the science, one of the science lecture theatres. Then the meeting house begun in 1967. Um, and here, um, Spence already beginning, I, mean, I think it's part of the sensitivity and the creativity of the university campus is that he's bringing in other architects. His son-in-law, Anthony Blee, is the co-architect in this, um, as uh, Charles Collins is for the art building, um, is that I seem a bit like, if I'm not treading on too many toes here, the architectural historian, that he's a sort of like Nash and Regent Street. You lay down the principle of certain ideas about design, steps, round things, um, use of, of, of brickwork and concrete as ways of giving um, other young architects a, a way forward within the parameters of, a, of an initial design idea. And then the art centre, and here's the, all the models have been refurbished for the exhibition. Here's the um, early, uh, the mid 60s, 1965 model um, of the um, art centre with its uh, designed in collaboration with the theatre designer um, and our space, and then small uh, spaces for ambulatories, uh, for um, exhibitions, for um, small um, drama presentations. In the current but very, very long-term restoration of this art centre, it is hoped to restore some of those original spaces um, back to the way they were first conceived. And here's the model for the physics building. Um, one of the things, so in, in summarising, as it were, Spence, Spence is the glamorous architect because he goes on after these buildings to do the embassy in Rome and uh, the Hyde Park barracks. Um, uh, the other thing about him that makes these buildings significant is the way he writes about the variety of sources that he uses. In this case, uh, he talks of the Stoa of Atticus, of these, as it were, shop entries underneath um, set-back facades with these great brick piers all along the building. Um, and of course, uh, when it comes to Falmer House himself, and again, sadly, you know, now great iron straps across to the health and safety reasons here, he is mentioning of the Colosseum in Rome and this playing of open and closed spaces. And in one interview, he says, this is about my ideas of the way the university would grow. Um, one of the things about the listing has been, of course, is now that the university will not dare interfere with these spaces and start to fill them in, or it will be a huge challenge to do so. Um, so it remains in the, with these great open spaces, and also on film, he says how he likes you to see through these spaces and to see behind the stasis of the architecture, the trees and the clouds moving um, through um, these buildings. So something about antique sources, which got people um, very, very um, excited um, um, in preserving these buildings. Originally, the concrete vaults were going to be um, uh, made in situ, but it was found cheaper and easier to make them um, in the casting yard, and then they were lifted, as this shot shows you, by cranes um, into place. 
One of the other things that Spence was very keen to do, which makes the buildings unique, is to reverse some of the original ideas about buildings and water. Um, he puts notes in the courtyard of Salma House rather than defensively, as one might see. And another local brick building from the 15th century, we're not far from Hurston, so a castle with a great brick structure surrounded by a moat. Here we have the moats inside the building. Again, though these are listed, the, the fabric of them is listed, the curbstones are listed. Um, uh, whilst I was promised, you know, we would fill them again with water, despite all the health and safety issues, um, for the duration of the exhibition, as we did for a big celebratory weekend at the start of the academic year, the hosepipe ban got in the way. So this in itself is already an historic um, photograph, and let's hope one day we will be able to see it like this again. It's something about the dappled light playing off these concrete surfaces, uh, which is it, it quite extraordinary um, when you go and look at these buildings. So the use of brick and concrete, and in a way this is Spence, the arts and crafts tradition, the brief time he spent in Lutchen's studio at the end of the 1920s, marrying his admiration for Le Corbusier and the use of precast concrete in buildings um, that he was very keen to also proselytize about. But in order to make the building local, this great tower and elsewhere in the buildings um, hints um, also of Sussex flint. No stone in the area, but you use flint from the downs to make this point about there is a continuity with the wonderful flint medieval churches we have and other things within the downscape. Um, so another reason why the particularity and peculiarity of the buildings um, uh, help them to be signed up um, to listing. Inside that flint staircase, still an original light fitting, Nordic Scandinavian designs that uh, uh, Spence approved of with a sheer wall of flint um, up those very dramatic stairs. Stairs are something I'm going to continually come back to um, in this talk today. One of the other things I think about Sussex, and I, I'm not sure that what I'm going through here is some original reasons for listing, and then the continual and changing reasons, and the research and art historical, architectural historical questions that we've gone on to ask since that time. One of the things I think is very important about um, uh, all buildings, and something I was talking about when I stepped in last time and gave that talk from the exhibition in America, is that it's very, very interesting the way buildings are recorded and the variety of means in which we record them. Here's another shot um, of the exhibition um, with the contour model in the foreground, the big picture of Spence. Um, you will see that I kept this exhibition very simple. There are no labels to the pictures uh, and objects individually. I simply, I simply have uh, uh, um, design specified wall panels um, and uh, something else I insisted on is that we would, we would only put black and white photographs with original material. We wouldn't let modern or even 1960s color fight with these very, very sensitive images. Um, the first line of recording, which is interesting about the university's past, is that in 1959, as president of the RIBA, Spence was heading off to Africa, and Lee tells me beyond Africa, actually, uh, for two, three months. So there was this, he captured this commission for the university, uh, and there was a lot of interest in it. It was the first of these 60s universities, which became thought of as the 60s universities, to be built. Um, but he set this young man, Peter Winchester, just out of architecture school, to design the campus, to think about the campus. And he clearly made some um, guidelines of advice round buildings, uh, keeping the landscape, keeping as many trees as possible, respecting the gradient and uh, the rising and fall of the landscape, which is, after all, like nearly all of us at these 60s universities, carved out of an 18th or 19th century landscape park. And it's three early drawings by Peter Winch, so they're sort of pastels, blue pastels, that you see on the right-hand side of that screen. And just with a handheld camera, I couldn't take the glass off, um, the most spectacular of them, this, not a, a prototype for the meeting house, but the original idea of having a grand meeting hall um, on campus, on the original contour map, is just beyond uh, Falmer House, 
um, to the left, uh, with trees in the landscape, somewhere where people would congregate. But what interested people a lot about these drawings from 1959 is the young Peter Winchester's interest in modern Italian design, great paved piazze, um, uh, arcades around buildings keeping up the traditions of Bologna and other places in Italy, rethinking those in modern materials and with modern means. So very exciting, and I find the six we've got by Winchester all extraordinarily beautiful. Um, early thoughts of the, marking that moment of the excitement of the first designs. And then we have works by Spence himself, watercolours of Salma House. Um, this certainly has got to rest when it comes down. It's been sitting in the registrar's office too long and I'm afraid, you know, if I had my way, it would not be seen anymore, but, um, or could be in the university's special collections and brought out for um, scholars and whatever to come and see, but um, is fading fast. Um, less sensitive are his wonderful, uh, spent his wonderful pastels um, here at the arts building, um, which he originally designed, and we've got a reproduction of it from the Edinburgh archive in the exhibition. Um, he originally designed these two great lecture halls on a sort of, um, they look like they're, they're sort of wings stretching out from these great pylons on a raised sort of um, plinth. Um, money wasn't possible, so though the, the lecture halls either side of the pylons here respect the rising landscape, it's a much more finalised uh, modern design. So we have, alongside the Peter Winch drawings from these early years, we have spent his own design in different media recording the early stages of the university. And then, of course, we have these famous um, photographs taken in the late 1960s by the photographer Hank Snook, um, which are very much, as you can all see, of their time, or of a genre of the history of photography. Light, dark contrasts, hardly any people in them, uh, making the buildings. Here's found the house again, as you saw earlier, look really like extraordinary film sets or something very much of their age. And again, I think of, I think of film, and Italian film in particular, when I look at these, a particular photographer's eye and a remarkable and fascinating series of photographs they, they, they are of their period. This one in particular, it's the back of Salma House with this great um, flint uh, tower that I showed you earlier. These great concrete um, uh, things sticking out from the wall here over a moat that we've now lost. That was filled in within about 10 or 15 years of the um, university's uh, first setting it up. Not only that, but you know, it's now crossed on one corner by a silly path, you know, because that's the way people use it instead of using the grid and whatever of the university. It also shows something else there to the left that the university campus was seen as a site for modern sculpture. We were lent Henry Moore's and other things which stayed on campus for some time in the late 1960s. Not really possible in this day and age given the sensitivity of an open site um, and the problems we would have, but there are various plans afoot to put some sculpture back into this landscape. Another reason why this very much captures, I think, a particular um, and very uh, valuable moment in time. And here's the last of them. This very wonderful view across the play, now with our backs to the library, looking out, um, just as the, at the time the meeting house was finished, um, with those trees, um, some of which have been there since the 18th century. We lost quite a few in the hurricane of 1987, um, uh, giving a sense of the parkland landscape and the line of the downs beyond. And wherever you stand in the original Spence building, all of the buildings sit within the line of the downs. Um, so though they invaded the downscape, they very much sit within it. Sadly, I can't say that to the football stadium. Um, but I've said enough about that today. What also photography records, and we have a remarkable series um, uh, taken at the time, were the processes of construction. And the one or two I've put in the exhibition, this isn't one of them, of course, people say, oh my goodness, look at these men, no hard hats, flappy jackets, no safety rails, um, another age of building practice. And I think if you've got a record like this, and it was a very, very full record of every brick being put in place, almost every brick being put in place, and
and the placing of the concrete being craned into position, you've got something about time which is very valuable and only really explained in terms of preserving the buildings that resulted from this process. Another good reason for having buildings on record are still surviving together. One other aspect I think that's very important, and here we start to see our, um, well I can't see it on the screen, you probably can just about in the uh, image there on, on the big screen, just before we took the bubble wrap off the plinth there. Um, uh, we needed to say something about the original furnishings of the university because Spence had very, very clear ideas about bright colours, bright rugs, bright um, chair fabrics. Um, he wanted Swedish and Scandinavian designs. He says in, his, in the archive in Edinburgh, in his personal files, he says how he thinks it's foolish of uh, these new institutions to start putting out this to one person and that to another, but to have some control over what these things look like. So what we've done in one particular area is just have some 1960s colour photographs, and alongside it we recovered, not in original materials, but um, a, an original Spence chair, um, in those bright blue colours that you see in the photographs um, alongside it, a way of evoking something of the original furnishings that Spence um, so much wanted. And of course, one of the interesting things about the listing is that a Grade 1 listed building, six two-star buildings, in only two cases are the interiors mentioned. One is in um, Thalma House, where you um, see um, uh, particular aspects of that are mentioned, and I'll be showing you a, 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 a bit of that in a moment. The other interior, which is, as it were, listed, or the listing gives an indication that, that, has, that this has been a way of making sure these things are observed, <coughs> is the interior of the Great Meeting House. Here's a view at night, where you see the colours of the glass, an obvious link with the glass at Coventry. And inside, uh, the original altar table um, with uh, the choir around it, our choir stalls with original cast seats made in um, concrete and then made in wood and concrete uh, around the choir. Um, but sadly, I have to say, um, those uh, uh, very splendid candle holders were sold by the university um, uh, uh, quite a number of years ago and have sat for quite a long time on the altar of St Stephen Wardrobe in London. Lord Palumbo knew what he was buying. Um, but um, there's still within the meeting house many of the original furnishings, many of the original fittings there. Um, here we are in Falmer House with the great chunky staircase that the 1993 listing members. This is again an early 60s photograph of the building when it was first in use. And also in um, the great dining hall um, of uh, of Salma House, the great Ivan Hitchens uh, Days Rest, Days Work uh, painting, which Ivan Hitchens painted this originally for exhibition of modern British artists at the BNA, I think in 1959. It then toured the country, and he writes to Spence in 1962 and says, um, I hear great things about your new university. Um, would you like me to donate this painting um, for uh, a big space there? Spence accepts on behalf of the university, and then there's a fascinating correspondence about the stretcher and the way it's all to be handled and hung on the wall, and it's been there ever since, with some but not um, profound uh, conservation. But what I also want to point out there is, of course, there are students dining in the hall, and one of the things I think is very important about the building up of knowledge and why it's worth listing the buildings and then going on researching about them because we've got this extraordinary fabric to explore is that in very recent times the history of the university's um, early dining practices have been investigated um, by our friend and colleague at the VNA and Eatwell who has led teams of students into further research on this um, and that has been an enormous benefit because um, I can remember um, in the mid-1960s, when without a car and being in my early teen years, I took coach, to, uh, coach trips to round country houses all over the country, desperate as I was to see them, and those weekends where I couldn't force my dad to take me to places. Um, I remember going one day to Chatsworth in the mid-60s, and we stopped at a motorway service station on the way back, and people came out thrilled and excited by plastic cutlery. They said, you know, it really does cut, it really does work. So what's interesting about that, and Acker the garages, is that what you have there is the matching of 
uh, motorway um, uh, buildings uh, serving the motorway, absolutely of their period, and the furnishings and the utensils that go with them. So what Anne has discovered um, from her trawl of university alumni is the way in which people say it was the first time we had three-pronged stainless steel forts. we have never seen one before. Um, so that it was the institution buying big, buying in bulk, that was able to play a role in transforming items of everyday use, which uh, is very, very important, I think, now as part of the university's early history. Campus Today, another photograph across, uh, looking across I took just the other morning. I said about lifting buildings, but allowing that elbow room for change. Some of the things that might have been thought were very important in 1993 are less important now. Others have risen in prominence. One, of course, is the ecology of the landscape and the environmental issues which now um, uh, beset us. So some of the downside are the safety rails and the, uh, you know, we can't have water here and we can't do this and that. But in other areas, the university um, has experimented quite profitably, I think, with allowing patches of wild flowers to grow, um, with watching the nature's year, as it were, in some areas of the university. So there are areas of not wilderness, but semi-wilderness across some of the lawns where you're thinking about what is the natural downscape and how can people see how if this would just let us chalk down and what would be growing here. Uh, I think that sensitivity um, uh, is, is very interesting and certainly something that's very uh, worthwhile. I want to end today, though, with um, a rather different case because within the last week or two, um, the library at the Albert Sloman, the first vice chancellor library at the University of Essex, has been refused listing. Um, this is because it's the university's, uh, it, it is or was, um, I'm not taking sides here or knowing quite what the thing is at the moment, we have new um, people coming into post, it's the university's proposal to demolish the octagonal stair which leads up to the university library um, uh, and uh, put other buildings and things in its place to reorganise the way in which the university library um, is used. Um, why is this building uh, worthy of listing? Well, um, as our colleague, uh, Professor Jules Lubbock, who has championed uh, the University of Essex and its building for many years and has led the campaign to get this building listed, is that uh, his argument is that um, it's one of those 1960s buildings that by its um, uh, different wall planes and surfaces challenges the graph paper architecture of the period that we saw in so much mass housing and of large expanses of glass that is interesting for those reasons. If you want, you know, the classical roots of this, well, um, these uh, pillars here are scored. The concrete is scored like the fluting of classical pilasters. And he makes the point, this is exactly the time when some of our motorways were going up with great Doric um, supports to them. And that's to say this interest in very basic classical design and going back in this kind of almost post and lintel construction to the early house, as we think of it from Vitruvius, being made of wood, um, albeit now in modern materials. Lots of good reasons why um, this should be um, preserved and listed per se, but on the staircase itself, and I'm going to show you two old black and whites, because the modern photographs, I have to say, with rubbish bins and a few um, tables in them do not do it justice, but they can be cleared away when this, if, if this eventually uh, survives and is going to be um, and, and gets listed and is all restored is that you approach the library up um, this staircase it was originally going to be a great spiral ramp um, uh, but it's one of the very very few um, staircases in an octagon uh, up to that point in British um, architectural history the idea was that you suggested the idea of a library because you passed along this corridor of concrete supports broken up by shafts of light, a sort of claustral feeling to where you were going to and what it was all about, and a sense of rising through the building um, towards the quiet um, of the library space. So a very, very important um, sign there of 
what this is about, and why the octagonal staircase is very, very much part and parcel of this very significant um, 60s building. Essex was a very, very different campus to that of Sussex. Um, it, it was not to have iconic buildings. Um, it doesn't have the equivalent of, of uh, a Salma house or a meeting house. Uh, those of you who've been there will know that students uh, were housed in, uh, in tower blocks, uh, which from a distance, Jules talks about San Gimignano and you know, the distant cities, and I go along with him a long way on that. Um, it, was, it continued the, uh, the landscape park effects in the park of Wivenhoe, which Constable painted, um, by creating a new lake uh, around this library building, um, so actually adding value to the landscape in all kinds of ways, ways in which um, it, these new universities were different, but actually said something um, about the 1960s in a very, very um, particular way. It was built, of course, by uh, Kenneth Capon from the Architecture and Planning Partnership, who may not, in the architecture history books, have quite the resonance of Basil Spence, but nevertheless a very, very significant uh, piece of work, and a piece of work now threatened, which is integral to his design. In the rationale for not listing this building, um, uh, uh, I will say we've been told, because this is, this is uh, as it were, um, shared knowledge now. English Heritage approved it, but the DCMS have turned it down, I should say, to um, uh, uh, look after our colleagues um, in, in, in English Heritage. It lacks special historic interest because it does not illustrate important aspects of the nation's social, economic, cultural, or military history. You can feel the ticking off points there, um, according to some guidelines that the DCMS is going by and does not have close historical association with nationally important people. Um, I hope what I've been suggesting today is that you could say the new students of the early 1960s were nationally important people. I'm sort of standing here almost as one of them, and others of you will be of that generation. Um, I didn't go to one of the new universities, so I was interviewed at two of them um, in the mid-1960s, um, is, that, is that that was a very, very significant cultural group of people, social group of people of that particular time, born in the year of the welfare state, etc., etc., um, that it may not be of obvious economic, cultural, military, or social significance, but they are in the context of how we're now reconfiguring the 1960s. So we may have got the timing wrong with this building, as I've shown the change with the garages, the change with my own university at Sussex, protected now for 20 years. Um, but that the, the changes that happen to it by research and by caring for these structures underlines their significance, builds on their significance. Um, and I think we may, or they may, have made the uh, entirely wrong decision here um, uh, in not giving this building immediate listing and therefore protecting something which is now under threat. But that's my personal view of this. As you will see, I did not intend today um, in pulling this together, because obviously it's partly been given elsewhere um, at the V&A design conference around the um, show, and do go and see the V&A show of British Design since 1948, because there's a great display of Coventry Cathedral with fabulous things on loan, and the maquette for Lasden um, buildings at, at the University of East Anglia, wonderful things to see um, from this period. Uh, but what I didn't want to do was to unpick and unpack the documents, as it were, of the listing process there are colleagues um, uh, who work with this who are much more expert than I. What I wanted to do was to talk about the deeper significance of these buildings, the changes that go on in and around them, and how there is need to build up the case not only up to the point when you do the listing, but to revisit that and keep making that case um, in the years thereafter. Thank you very much.